Jack Kerouac. Now we're at chapter two, so without further ado, let's dig in. In the month of July 1947, having saved about $50 from all veteran benefits, I was ready to go to the West Coast. My friend Remy Boncourt had written me a letter from San Francisco saying I should come and ship out with him on an around the world liner. He swore he could get me into the engine room. I wrote back and said I'd be satisfied with any old freighter as long as I could take off a few Pacific trips and come back with enough money to support myself in my aunt's house while I finished my book. He said he had a shack in Mill City and then I would have all the time in the world to ride there while we went through the rigmarole of getting the ship. He was living with a girl named Leanne. He said she was a marvelous cook and everything would jump. Remy was an old prep school friend, a Frenchman brought up in Paris, and a really mad guy. I didn't know how mad at this time. So he expected me to arrive in ten days. My aunt was in all accord with the trip to the West. She said it would do me good. I'd been working so hard all winter and staying in too much. She even didn't complain when I told her I'd have to hitchhike some. All she wanted from me was to come back in one piece. So, leaving my big half manuscript sitting on the top of my desk and folding back my comfortable home sheets for the last time one morning, I left with my canvas bag in which a few fundamental things were packed and took off for the Pacific Ocean with the $50 in my pocket. I'd been poring over maps of the United Station states in Patterson for months, even reading books about the pioneers and savoring names like Platt and Cimarron and so on. And on the road map was one long red line called Route 6 that led from the tip of Cape Cod clear to LA, Nevada, and there dipped down to Los Angeles. I'll just stay on 6 all the way to LA, I said to myself and confidently started. I 
stepped right up and gestured in the rain. They consulted. I looked like a maniac, of course, with my hair all wet, my shoes sopping. My shoes, damn fool that I am, were Mexican horachas. Plant-like sieves not fit for the rainy night of America and the raw road night. But the people let me in and rode me north to New Bern, where I accepted as a better alternative than being trapped in the bare mountain wilderness all night. Besides, said the men, there's no traffic passes through six. If you want to go to Chicago, you'd do better going across the Holland Tunnel in New York and head for and head for Pittsburgh. And I knew he was right. It was my dream that screwed up. The stupid earthside idea that it would be wonderful to want to follow one great red line across America instead of trying various roads and routes. In Newburgh it had stopped raining. I walked down to the river and I had to ride back to New York in a bus with a delegation of school teachers coming back from a weekend in the mountains. Chatter, chatter, blah, blah, and me swearing for all the time and the money I'd wasted and telling myself I wanted to go west and here I've been all day and into the night going up and down north and south like something that can't get started and I swore I'd be in Chicago tomorrow and made sure of that, taking a bus to Chicago, spending most of my money and didn't give a damn just as long as I'd be in Chicago tomorrow. On to chapter three. It was an ordinary bus trip with crying babies and hot sun and country folk getting on one pen town after another till we got on the plain of Ohio and really rolled up by Ashtabula and straight across Indiana in the night. I arrived in Chi, a brief, quite early in the morning, got a room in the Y and went to bed with a few dollars in my pocket. I docked Chicago after a good day's sleep. The wind from Lake Michigan, pop at the loop, long walks around South Hasselt and North Clark, Halsted and North Clark, and one long walk after midnight into the jungles, where a cruising car followed me as I suspicious character, where a, f where a cruising car followed me as a suspicious character. At this time, 1947, Bob was going like mad all over America. The fellows at the loop blew, but with a tired air, because Bob was somewhere between its Charlie Parker ornithology period and another period that began with Miles Davis. And as I sat there, listening to that sound of the night which Bob has come to represent for all of us, I thought of all my friends from one end of the country to the other and how they were really all in the same vast backyard doing something so frantic and rushing about. And for the first time in my life, the following afternoon, I went into the West. It was a warm and beautiful day for hitchhiking. To get out, the, out of the impossible complexities of Chicago traffic, I took a bus to Jollett, Illinois. Went by the jo Joliet Pen, stationed myself just outside town after walk through its leafy, rickety streets behind, and pointed my way. All the way from New York to Joliet by bus, I had spent more than half my money. My first ride was a dynamite truck with a red flag, about 30 miles into Great Green, Illinois. The truck driver pointing out the place where Route 6, which we were on, intersects Route 66 before they both shoot west for incredible distances. Along about three in the afternoon, after an apple pie and ice cream in a roadside stand, a woman stopped me in, stopped for me in a little coupe. I had a twinge of hard joy as I ran after the car, but she was a middle-aged woman, actually the mother of sons my age. I wanted somebody to help her drive to Iowa. I was all for it. Iowa. Not so far from Denver. And once I got to Denver, I could relax. 
She drove the first few hours, at one point insisted on visiting an old church somewhere, as if we were tourists. And then I took over the wheel and, though I'm not much of a driver, drove clear through the rest of Illinois to Davenport, Iowa, via Rock Island. And here, for the first time in my life, I saw my beloved Mississippi River, dry in the summer haze, low water, with its big, rank smell that smells like the raw body of America itself, because it washes it up. Rock Island, railroad track, shacks, small downtown section, and over the bridge to Davenport, same kind of town, all smelling of sawdust in the warm Midwest sun. Here, the lady had to go on to her Iowa hometown by another route, and I got out. The sun was going down. I walked, after a few cold beers, to the edge of town, and it was a long walk. All the men were driving home from work, wearing railroad hats, baseball hats, all kinds of hats, just like after work in any town anywhere. One of them gave me a ride up the hill and left me at a lonely crossroads on the edge of the prairie. It was beautiful there. The only cars that came by were farmer cars. They gave me suspicious looks. They clanked along. The cows were coming home, not a truck. A few cars zipped by. A hot rod kid came by with his scarf flying. The sun went all the way down and I was standing in the purple darkness. Now. I was scared. There weren't even any lights in the Iowa countryside. In a minute, nobody would be able to see me. Luckily, a man going back to Davenport gave me a lift downtown. But I was right where I started from. I went to sit at a bus station and think this over. I ate another apple pie and ice cream. That's practically all I ate all the way across the country. I know, I knew it was nutritious. And it was delicious, of course. I decided to gamble. I took a bus in downtown Davenport after spending a half hour watching a waitress in the bus station cafe and rode to the city limits, but this time near the gas stations. Here, the big tr trucks roared, wham, and inside two minutes, one of them cranked to a stop for me. I ran for it with my soul whooping, whooping. And what a driver, a great big tough truck driver with popping eyes and a hoarse raspy voice who just slammed and kicked at everything and got his rig underway and paid hardly any attention to me. So I could rest my tired soul for a little. For one of the biggest troubles hitchhiking is having to talk to innumerable people, make them feel that they didn't have a mistake, that they didn't make a mistake picking you up even entertain them almost, all of what, which is a great strain when you're going all the way and don't plan to sleep in hotels. The guy just yelled above the roar, and all I had to do was yell back, and we relaxed. And he bawled the thing clear to Iowa City and yelled me the funniest stories about how he got around in law in every town. How he got around the law in every town that had an unfair speed limit, saying over and over again, them goddamn cops can't put no flies on my ass. Just as we rolled into Iowa City, he saw another truck coming behind us, and because he had to turn off at Iowa City, he blinked his taillights at the other guy and slowed down for me to jump out, which I did with my back, and the other truck, acknowledging this exchange, stopped for me. And once again, in the twink of nothing, I was in another big high cab, all set to go hundreds of miles across the night. And was I happy? And the new truck driver was as crazy as the other, and yelled just as much. And all I had to do was lean back and roll on. Now I could see Denver looming ahead of me, like the promised land, way out there beneath the stars, across the prairie of Iowa the plains of Nebraska, and I could see the greater vision of San Francisco beyond, like jewels in the night. He bawled the jack and told stories for a couple of hours. Then, at a time in Iowa, 
where years later Dean and I were stopped on suspicion in what looked like a stolen Cadillac. He slept a few hours in the seat. I slept too, and took one little walk along the lonely brick walls illuminated by one lamp, with the prairie brooding at the end of each little street and the smell of the corn like dew in the night. He woke up with the start at dawn. Off we roared, and an hour later, the smoke of Des Moines appeared ahead of the green cornfields. He had to eat his breakfast now and wanted to take it easy. So I went right into Des Moines, about four miles, hitching a ride with two boys from the University of Iowa. And it was strange, sitting in their brand new comfortable car and hearing them talk of exams as we zoomed smoothly into town. No, I wanted to sleep a whole day. So I went to the Y to get a room. They didn't have any, and by instinct I wandered down the railroad tracks. And there are a lot of them in Des Moines. I wound up in a gloomy old Plains Inn of a hotel by the locomotive road roundhouse. And spent a lonely day sleeping on a big, clean, hard white bed with dirty remarks carved in the wall beside my pillow and the beet yellow window shades pulled over the smoky scene of the rail yards. I woke up as the sun was reddening. And what was the one distinct time in my life and that was the one distinct time in my life, the strangest moment of them all, when I didn't know who I was. I was far away from home, haunted and tired with travel, in a cheap hotel room I'd never seen, hearing the hiss of steam outside and the creak of the old wood of the hotel, and footsteps downstairs and all the sad sounds. And I looked at the cracked high ceiling and didn't really know who I was for about 15 strange seconds. I wasn't scared. There was just somebody else. Some stranger. And my whole life was a haunted life. The life of a ghost. I was halfway across America. Fighting line between the east of my youth and the west of my future. And maybe that's why it happened right there and then, that strange red afternoon. But I had to kept, get going and stop moaning. So I picked up my bag, said so long to the old, old hotel keeper sitting in his platoon, and I went to eat. I ate apple pie and ice cream. It was getting better as I got deeper into Iowa. The pie bigger. The ice cream richer. There were the most beautiful beavies of girls everywhere I looked in Des Moines that afternoon. They were coming home from high school, but I had no time now for thoughts like that and promised myself a poll in Denver. Carlo Marx was already in Denver. Dean was there. Chad King and Tim Gray were there. It was their hometown. Mary Lou was there. There was mention of a mighty gang, including Ray Rollins and his beautiful blonde sister, Babe Rollins. Two waitresses they Dean knew, the Betancourt sisters, and even Roland Major, my old college writing buddy, was there. I looked forward to all of them with joy and anticipation, so I rushed past the pretty girls and the prettiest girls in the world live in Des Moines. A guy with a kind of tool shack on wheels, a truck full of tools that he drove standing up like a modern milkman, gave me a ride up the long hill, where I immediately got a ride from a farmer and his son heading out for the Adel in Iowa. In this town, under a big elm tree near a gas station, I made the acquaintance of another hitchhiker, a typical New Yorker, an Irishman who'd been driving a truck for the post office most of his work years. I was now at it for a girl in Denver and a new life. I think he was running away from something in New York. The law, most likely. He was a real red-nosed drunk of 30 and would have bored me ordinarily, except that my senses were sharp for any kind of human friendship. He wore a beat sweater and baggy, baggy pants and had nothing with him in the way of a bag, just a toothbrush and handkerchiefs. He said we ought to hitch together. 
should have said no, but he looked pretty awful on the road. But we stuck together and got a ride with the tech intern man, the Stewart, Iowa, a town in which we were really stranded. We stood in front of the railroad ticket shack in Stewart, waiting for the westbound traffic till the sun went down a good five hours, dawdling away the time, at first telling about ourselves. Then he told dirty stories. Then we just kicked pebbles and made goofy noises of one kind and another. We got bored. I decided to spend a buck on beer. We went to an old saloon, Stewart and had a few. There he got as drunk as he ever did in his Ninth Avenue night back home and yelled joyously in my ear all the sordid dreams of his life. I kind of liked him. Not because he was a good sort, as he later proved to be, but because he was enthusiastic about things. We got back on the road in the darkness, and of course nobody stopped and nobody came by much. Then went on till three o'clock in the morning. We spent some time trying to sleep on the bench at the railroad ticket office, but the telegraph clicked all night and we couldn't sleep, and big freights were just slamming around outside. We didn't know how to hop a proper chain gang. We'd never done it before. We didn't know whether they were going east or west, or how to find out what boxcars and flats and de-iced reefers to pick, and so on. So, when the Omaha bus came through just before dawn, we hopped on and joined with the sleeping passengers. I paid for his fare as well as mine. His name was Eddie. He reminded me of my cousin-in-law from the Bronx. That was why I stuck with him. It was like having a, having an old friend along, a smiling, good-natured sort of goof. A smiling, good-natured sort to goof along with. We arrived at Council Bluffs at dawn. I looked out. All winter I'd been reading of the great wagon parties that held council there before hitting the Oregon and Santa Fe trails. And of course now it was only cute suburban cottages of one damn kind and another, all laid out in the dismal gray dawn. Then Omaha, and, by God, the first cowboy I saw walked along the bleak walls of the wholesale meal, meat warehouses in a ten-gallon hat and Texas boots. Looked like any beat character of the Brickwell Dawns at the East, except for the get-up. We got off the bus and walked clear up the hill. The long hill formed over the millenniums by the mighty Missouri, alongside of which Oma is built, and got out to the country and stuck our thumbs out. We got a brief ride from a wealthy rancher in a ten-gallon hat, who said the valley of the Platte was as great as the Nile Valley of age, Egypt. And as he said, so I saw the great trees in a distance that snaked with the river bed and the great verdant fields around it, and almost agreed with him. Then as we were standing at another crossroads, and it was starting to get cloudy, another cowboy, this one six feet tall in a modest half-gallon hat, called us over and wanted to know if either of us could drive. Of course Eddie could drive, and he had a license, and I didn't. Cowboy had two cars with him that he was driving back to Montana. His wife was at Grand Island, and he wanted us to drive one of the cars there, where she'd take over. At that point, he was going north, and that would be the limit of our ride with him. But it was a good hundred miles to Nebraska, and of course, we jumped for it. And he drove alone, the cowboy and myself following, and no sooner were we out of town than Eddie started to ball that jack 19 miles an hour out of sheer exuberance. Damn me, what's that boy doing? The cowboy shouted and took off after him. It began to be like a race. For a minute I thought Eddie was trying to get away with the car, and for all I know, that's what he meant to do. But the cowboy stuck to him and caught up with him and tooted the horn. Eddie slowed down. The cowboy 
said any. I didn't realize it on this smooth road. Just take it a little easy. We'll all get to Grand Island in one piece. Yeah, I have to stop there for a second.